Friends, please welcome your host for the evening, all the way from the University of Michigan, Dr. Vic Strecker. Right here. Hey, let's give it up for the Billy Harrington Trio. Unbelievable. Thank you so much. Whoa. That is some rockin' music for the Mendelssohn Theater. I don't know if it's ever rocked out that much. And I uh, just want to, you know, these guys just finished their British Invasion live national tour. Really cool, guys. Amazing music. We're going to hear them all evening. And uh, by the way, thank you for the nice introduction, all the way from uh, the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, so I just want to say, um, in being here, you are supporting five unique social service organizations throughout Michigan Medicine, and they include Ann Arbor Meals on Wheels. Yeah, amazing, amazing organization. The Housing Bureau. We're going to learn about all these pretty soon. The Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, or OLLI. Really big. That is huge. So many of us. The Silver Club Memory Programs. Go Memory Programs. And the Turner Senior Wellness Program. So important. All right. This is great. I know there weren't enough bartenders tonight, but it sounds like you guys are all set to have a nice evening. Each program, each of these programs we're talking about serves different needs in the older adult community, our community right here, and we're going to learn about them uh, a little bit later. I just want to give you a brief history of the fundraising success of Big Hearts for Seniors. In 2006, the Big Hearts for Seniors had their very first fundraiser. It was a silent auction, and it was silent. <laughs> I think they made about $8. In 2008, they had a walk and fun run. People got tired. In 2014, they had a movie premiere at the Michigan Theater, Go Michigan Theater, great place. And that was nice, nice movie. And then, but you know, it really was incredible because I remember when we first started talking about this and a new way of doing this through storytelling in 2020, I was personally absolutely shocked at how little this organization was raising compared to many other organizations and compared to what they did to people who were in tremendous need in our community. And so in 2020, thanks to many people who are here and, and um, you know, who will, one who will be telling her story, um, we started a storytelling event. And in 2020, they made $76,000, which is good. Very good for them. I mean, they didn't expect to make more than $50,000. They were then able to buy soup for people for lunch who were coming in. I mean, it was that desperate. They had, you know, they were elated for $50,000. $50,000 will not buy a plaque on a urinal in Chrysler Auditorium. So, come on, give me a break. We're talking about something actually that's very serious here. In 2021, $94,000 was raised. Those are record-breaking years, and it was during a pandemic. And we did it, they did it, online, which is stunning. So, way to go, Big Hearts for Seniors. That was really super cool. In 2022, this year, there is a $100,000 goal. And... Uh, this is a new Michigan Medicine signature event. This is, you know, this has made it to the big time. We're in the big leagues now, and thanks to Michigan Medicine, thanks to the development people here, now suddenly the engine is moving in a way that it really always should have been doing uh, to support these people who are in tremendous need. So thank you all for doing that. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Without these sponsors, this event would not exist. Would you mind, the sponsors, would you mind standing up? Would that be okay? Really love to give a hand to these sponsors. Thank you. Thank you to the committee. The committee is made up mostly of volunteers. Volunteers giving up very busy, you know, times during COVID, during the pandemic to meet Many, many meetings go into something like this, as you know. Um, would the volunteers and the staff members and the directors of the five programs, would you mind standing up? 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, it is story time. I want to introduce Bill Krieger. Bill is the Veterans Affairs Program Manager for Consumers Energy and the host of the Me, You, Us podcast. He is focused on easing, there is Bill. He is focused on easing the transition of veterans into civilian work and enhancing their personal well-being. He's also a retired army captain with 21 years of service and has been deployed in Iraq. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Bill is a founding member and past co-chair of the Veterans Advisory Panel at Consumers Energy. He holds a master's degree in organizational leadership at Central Michigan University. Go Chips. Nice. And Bill is married. They're Chips, right? They are Chips. That's what I thought. No one said, no one cheered. No Any chips. chips in here? Only Chips. Not a single chip? Come on. Fine. Uh, Bill is married with three grown children and one grandchild. I think his wife is somewhere over here, is that right? Would you stand up? Come on, come on. Behind every storyteller is an awesome partner. That's right. He enjoys storytelling, music, classic cars, and spending time with his family. His story is destination unknown. Let's give a big hand for Bill Krieger. On October 13th, 2007, I stepped off the battlefield in Mosul, Iraq, and onto the airplane that would take me home. And two weeks later, I found myself driving from my home in Holt, Michigan, to my office in Lansing, Michigan. And when I arrived at my office, I got out of my car, and I locked it up, and I smiled because it was going to be an amazing day. And it wasn't going to be an amazing day for all the reasons you might think. It wasn't because the sun was shining or because it was a warm fall day or even because the birds were chirping. It was going to be an amazing day because no one shot at me and nothing blew up. Now, my very next thought was, I'm a crazy person because no one thinks this way. But I made my way into the office and I started my journey back to the civilian world. But what I found happening was I had sort of lost my empathy for others. I remember sitting in a meeting one day, and uh, our folks that work in the field have to wear these little vests so they don't get run over, and somebody was complaining about this vest, that it was too hot outside, and it was going to be dangerous, and they might get dehydrated, and uh, I remember kind of yelling at them, like, why don't you put on 100 pounds of gear and walk around in 120 degree weather, and then you can come back here and complain. And I heard somebody in the back of the room say, man, that Bill Krieger's got an anger management problem. I did. I had an anger management problem, and I found myself getting more and more angry. Uh, I remember playing a game with my children one night, and, uh, you know, seven and nine years old, and my youngest daughter likes to pick on my oldest daughter, and they were kind of going back and forth, and I had about enough of it. Uh, so I picked up the game off the table, and I threw it against the wall, and I told my two little kids to shut the hell up, and I walked out of the room. And I felt embarrassed and ashamed and angry all at the same time. Well, as this was going on, I got the added bonus of having panic attacks. And I don't know if you've ever had one of those, so I'll describe it for you. For me, a panic attack is your heart is beating out of your chest. You feel like you're going to die. I sweat profusely, and I just want to run away from whatever it is that's coming to get me, but there's nothing. I have nothing to run away from. And so I started down this spiral of anger and panic attacks. And, and the panic attacks would happen at any time, when I'm in the shower, when I'm having lunch with someone, when I'm driving in my car. And it really got to be just too much. And by the summer of 2008, I was tired. I was done. Like, I, I was just done. And I remember that my kids were outside playing in the yard like kids do. And my wife was off doing something, shopping or something. And, and I was in the house just sort of putzing around. And I decided that I would go upstairs to the gun safe and clean my guns. Because I hadn't done that in a while. And I did it. I took care of it. I put everything away. And as I was putting that last gun away, I noticed that there was a bullet laying on the ground. It had fallen out of a box. So I picked it up 
And I knew which gun it went to, so I grabbed that gun. And I was just thinking to myself, I'm just really tired right now. I just, I, I want this whole thing to stop. And I dropped that bullet in the gun, and I let that slide go forward. And it was like I wasn't even there at all. And pretty soon, I was pointing this gun at my face. And I had my finger on the trigger. And just as I was about to squeeze that trigger, my phone rang. And it scared the hell out of me. I almost shot myself by accident. <laughs> so, I, so I put the gun down, and I answered the phone. And it was a friend of mine, and they were just calling to see how I was doing. And I did what I did best at that time. I lied. I said, I'm doing great. Everything's fine. My life is perfect. And from the outside, my life did look perfect. But on the inside, I was a mess. And I decided right then that I better go get some help because I needed it, obviously. And after a lot of years of therapy, I finally got my head back on straight. Now, there are people in the audience that would argue that my head was never on straight to begin with, <laughs> but I got it back on straight. And things were going really good for Bill Krieger. My career took off, my family was doing well, everything was perfect uh, until a few years ago uh, when the panic attacks started happening again and the anger started happening again. And I thought, what the hell is going on? Like, I took care of this. This has been fixed. I went to therapy. I got it all done. Why is this coming back? And finally, one day, as I was driving to my office in Flint, Michigan now, uh, it was too much. I was having a panic attack in my car, and I pulled off to the side of the road, and uh, I called a friend of mine, and he's here today, Keith Owen. And I said, I'm not really sure what's going on, but I can't do this anymore. And uh, so he told me what to do. I called my boss, and I said, I need to take a little time off from work because I don't feel good. And that little time off from work turned into about three months off from work so I could get my mental health back in shape. Uh, but what I discovered in talking to my doctor and talking to my therapist and talking to some other folks who know me pretty well is that my job was killing me. I needed to do something different. I had been doing leadership stuff for as long as I can remember, and it was time to be an individual contributor. And that's a scary thought when you're a 55-year-old male because most companies would just send you out the door and tell you to have a nice life. You can collect your pension now. And I wasn't ready to do that. So I did call my boss, and I said, look, I'm, I'm well enough to come back to work, but I can't do this job that you're paying me to do anymore. What can we do? And he told me, don't worry about it. We'll figure this out. Uh, just continue taking some time off. We'll get it straightened out. And I believed him. And a few weeks later, that same guy called me on the phone. He was coming back from Chicago. He'd been to a funeral. You see, one of our coworkers, who's also a veteran, actually died from suicide. And he had been to that funeral. And he called me and said, Bill, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to go to another funeral. I don't want to have to deal with this again. I don't know what this looks like or what the job description is, but would you be willing to come in and take care of our veterans for us? Because we hire a lot of veterans, and once we get them here, we want to be able to take care of them. And I said yes immediately. There was a need that needed to be filled. And from that, no job description, we don't know what this job is, we don't know what it looks like. We are now offering all sorts of great resources, not only to our veterans, but to all of our coworkers who are in need, because it's not just veterans that go through these things. I'm able to host a podcast that talks about well-being from all perspectives. I'm able to touch people where they're at and change their lives. And it has been an amazing journey for me. And I used to think, that getting well was this trip from A to B. But it's really not. There is no real destination when it comes to our mental health and our personal well-being. It is truly a journey. And I can tell you this, that today is May 17th, and when I step off from this stage, I'm going to step onto that road and see where it takes me. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and thank you for your service. 
Now it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Holland. For nearly three decades, Mark has been a published playwright with five titles currently in print. His plays have been produced over 500 times across the country. Mark first worked in front of an audience at the age of 18 months and has decided to remain until he is asked to leave. His story, acceptance. Please welcome Mark Holland. I've had a love-hate relationship with acceptance over the course of my life. And nobody ever really tells you what you should or you shouldn't accept. Well, it was easier when I was young and still knew everything. I was accepted by my peer group. I was accepted by sports teams. I was accepted at the drama club. I, well, I accepted a whopper of a ticket when I wrecked the family car. Um, but, you know, I thought that was a fluke, might never happen again. And, and the other person that I collided with, they changed lanes right before. So I, well, I guess I accepted the ticket, but I didn't actually accept the responsibility. I accepted a scholarship to go to school. I accepted a job offer. A yov lovely young woman accepted my offer of marriage. You see, overall, acceptance was very easy. I got married. I spent the next several years not accepting no for an answer as I tried to get the plays that I'd written produced. I was very good at that. But if the reviews came back less than stellar, that I did not accept. A little further along in our journey, when perhaps we've accepted a few things we shouldn't have, but enough about credit card debt, <clears throat> I found myself at 35, my hair already white. So I began to experiment with dyes, and they made me look like Wayne Newton. <laughs> and then at 40, I began to lose my hair. Well, I knew I could wear a wig, but if I was going to go back to that dark pompadour of my mid-20s, uh, then I was going to look like a Wayne Newton impersonator. <laughs> so I kind of had to accept going bald. But about six years ago, I came up against a situation that I absolutely could not accept. I was, I was out of energy. I was wheezing from smoking cigarettes for 35 years. My blood pressure was high and I was depressed. So after years of neglecting my health, I went to a doctor, and when she asked me questions, I told her the truth. A revolutionary concept, right? And yes, she made some suggestions, and yes, she wrote me out some prescriptions, but the moment where my doctor changed my life is where she looked me in the eye and said, you know, your anger is killing you. Well. This was my wake-up call. Would I accept the charges? Because it was at that moment that I realized that when I don't accept things, I take that, that disappointment or that embarrassment, and I turned it into anger. And I used it as a club against friend and foe alike, including people that I loved. So yes, I took her suggestions, and yes, I took the medications, and today, six years later, I stand a chance of living a long life. I've become a famoya. You know what that is? F-A-M-O-Y-A. -A. They say it about me all the time. They say, well, you're in very good health for a man of your age. <laughs> That's all right. I accept it. Recently, I saw the true value of acceptance. I had an a accident with my pickup truck. Now, I don't have to tell you any more about that accident in order to tell this story, but because I've accepted it. I'm going to tell you the whole story. I had a little accident with my pickup truck when I drove it through my garage door. From the outside. I'll tell you how it happened. It was a cold, wet morning, and my truck is a little too big to fit into the garage, so I park off to the side. We have a two-car garage and a one-car driveway, so I'll pull up in front of the garage and then back out straight. Well, the first part went fine. And then my foot slipped off the brake pedal and onto the accelerator, and boom. My first accident in 41 years. 
I could have done just what I did back then, say, well, it's a fluke. Never happened again. I could have looked for somebody else to blame. But I knew this was probably something I needed to try and accept. So I took a look at the brake pedal. I took a look at the tread. The tread was fine. I took a look at my work boot. The tread on my boot was fine. But getting in and out of the car a couple of times, I noticed that my seat had been moved. And my wife had borrowed my car and moved the seat. Well, I could have blamed her. But I realized that part of accepting my mistakes and my shortcomings is accepting other people's mistakes and their shortcomings. But that's not what I learned. What I learned was anger will not talk about that accident and will dare you to bring it up. Acceptance called their homeowner's insurance and was told, well, of course we'll cover that. That's why you have homeowner's insurance. Anger, anger will look at that paint transfer that was on my hood from the garage door every morning and just curse the day. But acceptance took a cotton rag and some toothpaste and rubbed all that paint away. This is what I'm doing with the rest of my life. Because even when things go wrong, I still want to be happy. So maybe, maybe for you, the next time you make a really big mistake or something simply goes wrong and you're stuck dealing with it, maybe you'll consider, is this something that I should be accepting? And if the only reason you ask yourself that question is because you're remembering that goofball that drove through his garage door, I can accept that too. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to tell you my story tonight. In the immortal words of Wayne Newton, Dunk a shame. All right. Hi, everyone. Can we get another round of applause for Mark Holland? Fantastic job. Some of you might remember him from a couple years ago. He was such a great storyteller. We just had to have him back this year. So my name is Jennifer Howard. I'm the director of the Turner Senior Wellness Program, and it is my pleasure to reintroduce to you Dr. Vic Strecker, who is our special guest storyteller this evening. Vic Strecker is an award-winning pioneer in the field of behavioral science and a professor at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Vic lost his 19-year-old daughter, Julia, to a rare heart disease that resulted from, infant, from an infant case of chickenpox. This life, event resulted, this life event challenged every aspect of Strecker's personal and professional experience and drove him to an exhaustive search from ancient philosophy to cutting-edge science to pinpoint the potential and impact of purpose in our lives. He is a well-known speaker, author, and guide in the area of living our lives with purpose. He has been a true friend to Michigan Medicine community programs for older adults in the area. And now, to tell his story entitled The Dance, it is my pleasure to reintroduce to you Dr. Vic Strucker. Thank you very much. So I thought about this when I was asked to do a story. I thought, this is about journeys, and it's 2022. And I thought, let's go back 50 years when I was at a dance, <laughs> 1972. I was at a sock hop at Okemos High School. Now, I grew up w very shy. I grew up with Tourette syndrome, so I twitched a lot. I had a lot of pimples. I was really, really, really skinny. I was not that athletic at all. And again, I think I said I was shy. So being at a sock hop was terrifying for me. Going to a dance was absolutely terrifying. And those people you see up there dancing, that was not me. Those people in the back just standing there like that, that was me. <laughs> and I don't know if any of you can relate to that, but I certainly was always terrified and kind of waiting for somebody to ask me to dance, which no one, of course, did. And I was way too terrified to be turned down, you know, asking somebody to dance. But then, you know, suddenly this song came on in 1972, and I couldn't help it. 
It was by Edgar Winter, and he had just come out with this song called Frankenstein. Anyone remember Frankenstein? It kind of started. <laughs> right? Nice, cool. Okay. And I was, I couldn't help it. I had to ask somebody. So I asked this girl, and she's going, oh, okay, fine. And so I'm dancing, and then, like, I'm totally getting into the dance, totally. Oh, my God, this is so great. And then suddenly, this middle riff in it that was kind of some of the very early electronic guitar music went. Remember that? Okay. So, and in the middle of this, I just flip out, like my eyes go to the back of my head and I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And I'm like, down further and further and my eyes are closed and I'm like turning around and flipping around. And, and you know, then suddenly I just opened my eyes and everybody on the dance floor is surrounding me. <laughs> and this girl says, like, are you okay? I know they thought I was having a seizure, but, um, and it was really quite embarrassing for the next couple of years of my life when that happened. Quite honestly, I kept thinking, why did I do that? Why did I express myself that way? This was the worst thing that could have happened to a shy person with Tourette's and all this stuff. And it's funny because about five years later, I met a woman who accepted that. In fact, she would go, wow, you are a good dancer. I love dancing with you. And that's my wife, Jerry, right there. And <laughs> because she would tell me while I was this nerdy student in college then, she'd say, you know, and I was a math and science major, and she said, you are one of the most creative people I've ever met. And I can't believe she would have said that. I said, no, I'm in math and science. I'm not creative. Those people are not creative. And she said, no, not in terms of painting paintings or anything like that. You are just one of the most creative people I've ever met. You have this thing in you that, that just always has to come out that's so creative and, and cool. And, you know, that was the first person who ever said that, who ever thought that about me. And as a result, suddenly, my whole life started blossoming because of that. I had this opportunity last year to give a commencement address at Frankfurt High School in northern Michigan, if anyone knows where Frankfurt is. I think everybody over 60 should be forced to do a commencement address to high school students. I mean, because it forces you to think, okay, what have I learned since high school, since that sock op? What are the things I learned? Well, first of all, I learned that all the people I wanted to be, I now don't want to be. And a lot of the people who were kind of geeks and nerds and misfits ended up being pretty interesting people that I really enjoy and still do. And so I told them, basically trying to channel what my wife did for me, I said, when you guys find a partner, if you find a partner, as you start going through life and you find somebody, make sure that that person sees this light in your eyes sees this special thing about you and helps build that and doesn't try to denigrate you because if they're talking down to you or denigrating you or making you feel bad, run away, I told these high school students because so many of them are lost. And now in this era of COVID, when we're just sitting in our rooms all the time in our apartments, it's even more important to be basically trying to get together and love and care for one another I think seniors have such a role in helping younger people grow up properly. Jean-Paul Sartre once said, we know everything now except how to live. And he's still right. We still have not figured out how to actually live our lives. I think seniors can help that a great deal. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to say that Big Hearts for Seniors gets seniors onto the dance floor. They help them live bigger, fuller, and more secure lives. And I want to emphasize secure, because you can't go out on that dance floor and, and make an ass of yourself unless you have some degree of security. So it's really, really important. 
And we're gonna show this video, a caring community, big hearts for seniors, and this video will show just how that happens. A great community is a community where people can grow, they can learn, they can thrive. A caring community takes, takes care of each other, um, looks out for each other. People who will give of their time and their resources and the gifts and talents that they have to support one another. Everybody has their needs met. To share experiences, to learn together, so that we can be a community that loves and cares about each other across the lifespan. Ali is a great program. It lets those individuals who are 50 and older continue to learn, um, continue to live, become lifelong learners, dream that dream that they hadn't done in their youth um, as they retire to continue to be engaged, to give back, and develop the programming that they love. It's just a, a, an organization that gives so much enrichment to retirement. I think it's, it's a way to keep your mind active and keep you engaged in life and the world. It's an organization that allows you to create something that you're interested in or something that you want to know more about. That whole aspect of Ollie is, 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 is crucial. I'm so, so grateful that I found it. So with dementia, there are a lot of frustrations, a lot of unknowns. And it's scary for the people that have dementia and their families. So it's very important to have a place like Silver Club where people can be around other people who are experiencing similar situations and going through similar challenges. And we come and have fun. We laugh, we joke around, we don't take life too seriously. And it's really a place where people can be themselves and really sit with their struggles and focus on the positive in life. I would say I'm really enjoying my time with the Silk Club. And they're all very, very, I should say, not only friendly, they treat me like a family member. It's, it's good, it, it keeps your mind going, it keeps you, you know, go, it gets you into the thing. And it's, uh, and you meet people. There are a lot of nice people. And I, and I enjoy this a lot. It's, it's important to me. Ann Arbor Meals on Wheels was started almost 50 years ago to serve homebound members of our community and support them as they age in place. We serve between 700 and 800 meals on each delivery day usually. Um, and over the course of the year, we typically serve about 120,000 meals. This is a good thing to do. Um, gives me a lot of satisfaction. I've been always wanting to do this, and I'm, I'm, I've got an opportunity to do it, and I, I feel so, so great. <laughs> and with some of those folks, we're probably the only person they're going to see that day. We get much more out of it than we give, uh, and, and if that isn't the essence of community, I don't know what is. Between all of our programming, so foreclosure prevention, eviction prevention, housing counseling, a tax program, um, we're touching about 750 um, people each year. There is a fair amount of ageism that happens. I think um, a lot of older adults are, being, are taken advantage of, um, disrespected, discounted. They're one crisis away from, uh, actually one injury away from crisis, I guess is the way to put it. I was uh, getting close to having foreclosure and uh, I didn't know what to do. So I called and connected with Janet Hunkel and she was right there and helped me because I was not only was I facing that, I was also facing a major health issue. It feels really good to have helped someone. Seeing the satisfaction and the, the relief you can just see fall off of a person's body when you know that you can help them and you tell them that you can help them. Um, it feels good. It feels gratifying. I can barely think straight and all these things are coming at me. So I had a person that I could trust, basically, with my life. 
The wellness program was designed to help meet the needs of the community, to serve as a place where people can engage in activities that help promote health and wellness, and also it serves as a community resource, as a resource center. We see people come together in these rooms to socialize, spend time together. We're just trying to give people the resources that they need to live healthy, vibrant lives and happy, vibrant lives. We have what's called Gallery 55. We have local artists who are ages 55 plus who can display their works of art and present their artwork. We do healthy cooking presentations. And so we have a kitchen here and we've got a beautiful mirror where people can sit out in our lobby and they can watch what the chef is doing and they can sample the food and they can learn how to prepare healthy meals at home. It's just so much fun and there's so much life and energy here and that becomes something that you really just wanna be a part of. The whole center here and especially our wellness program is a matter of aging with spirit, knowledge, and friendship. Those are some of the very kinds of things that it takes to make a community. You have to have people together. You have to have information. You have to have friendships. That's what we do here. Big Hearts wanted to show you what they did, what they do. Big Hearts wants to show what they believe in. And here's what those five community programs believe in. They believe in the health, in the vitality, in the contribution, and the inclusion of older adults, and that that is key to having a strong community. And that's why we so appreciate all of your support. I am now really thrilled to introduce Mark A. Harris. Mark is an experienced fitness instructor and personal trainer. I'm going to call him later. He inspires and educates those who want to improve their cognitive and physical health and fitness. Since 1999, he's developed fitness programs in the community and for area hospitals and physicians. Mark has been teaching senior fitness classes since 2006. After being diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2013, he became a community ambassador with the American Cancer Society and ad an advisory board member of the University of Michigan's Rogel Cancer Center, an advisory board member for the University of North Carolina and Henry Ford Health System in a study that they funded by Genentech. He's also a co-facilitator of the Michigan Institute of Urology's Prostate Cancer Support Group, and he's the first Prostate, the first prostate cancer consultant for Merck Pharmaceuticals. He's busy. He likes to ride his bike, work out, and read. I don't know how he has the time to do any of those things. His story is the bright side. Please welcome Mark A. Harris. All right. Last month I was at uh, Xfinity store and I was doing as I usually do, saying hi to everybody, how's your day? And I asked this young lady, she said, fine, and how's your day? I said, fantastic. And she looked at me for several seconds like I had a unicorn horn. And I, I said, uh, and she said, why? I said, the Lord woke me up and I'm still alive. And so she said, well, that's a good attitude. So that attitude comes, is built on how my parents raised us. We were raised, I'm the oldest of five, to love everyone and to look at the bright side. And when my dad died in 1968, my mother would add, as I remember, you may not see it now, but look for the bright side, it's there. So, <clears throat> which is, and that, that, that fun, the, the thing number two is, I met a man who was shot in the back when he escaped Auschwitz, uh, the, of course, the concentration camp in Poland. And when I met him, you can clearly see the numbers on his, on his wrist. And I said to him one day, I said, you know, people are dying. You're praying every day. More people are dying, and you're still praying. How do you not lose faith? <clears throat> he said, Mark, 
it's, the, it's who you are. It's the foundation of who you are. And with that as my foundation, I've been overcome the challenges that life throws at me. So for instance, on October the 3rd, 2013, I just started watching the movie, uh, eight o'clock movie, and the phone rings. It's Dr. Solomon telling me that the prostate cancer, the biopsy came back for prostate cancer, and he would do everything he could to help. And so I know most people would, would focus on the cancer news, but I, what resonated with me is that he would do everything he could to help. So, and I, I realize now, again, this happened in 2013, I just realized this last month, going over this for this story, that was the bright side. And so when he said that, I said thank you. And I continue to say thank you all through that call, so to the point I think Dr. Solomon said, you know, I'm telling him that he has cancer and he's thanking me. So, I, so he said, just to be clear, you have, <laughs> You have, uh, and he said something like this, and he, he's too professional to put it this way, but you have prostate cancer and I will help you. And I said, thank you. <laughs> so when he, um, we were hung up the phone, I sat there and I was thinking, should I tell my wife, my daughter, my, my ex-wife, her mother? And I was thinking that because in my mind as a man, you know, as a father, as a, a husband, you're supposed to be the, the rock, the problem solver, not the reason there is a problem. But I got over that after about a minute. And so <laughs> I called out to my wife and I said, uh, you know, the prostate, uh, the biopsy came back positive for prostate uh, cancer. And she comes running in and with great care. And <clears throat> she asked, so I started, uh, started asking questions. But I realized I had taken that news and just put it, put it away somewhere in the back of my brain. So she's asking me some questions. I, I don't want to deal with it right now. And so on the last question, and I may have made a mistake here, but you got to remember I was in the moment. She said, she asked her question. I said, can't you see I'm watching this movie? And so, <laughs> so, so <laughs> I was in the moment though, all right. So, um, so she went back in there and I watched the rest of that movie and I can't tell you what it was about. I realized the movie was just white noise. It's just, it's just taking up space. And so after that movie is over, I went to bed and in the solitude, now I have, and no distractions, now I have time to think about this. And my human side said, you're gonna die, you're gonna die, I'm gonna die. But then my spiritual side said, well, now how are we gonna use this to help others? Because that's what God does. He gives me experiences that I can fulfill my purpose which is to help others. And so, which was a blessing for our family because six days later, we learned that my son Michael was diagnosed with a different cancer. Uh, it was an adenocarcinoma of the parotid gland. So he had uh, cancer of the saliva gland. And so it was a rare form because we were at St. Joe and after two weeks we had got transferred over to U of M. And, but, when we first learned about the, the diagnosis, again, it was a blessing that I had been diagnosed first because I could go into, I, I didn't go into parent mode, my son's gonna die, my son has cancer, I'm gonna die. I went into dad mode, okay? We're, we're on this journey together, I can help you, we can support each other, so that was, and that was a blessing. The second blessing was that I had prostate cancer, I had a low grade prostate cancer, so I could kind of put my health on hold and deal with him. So again, during this time, we just had plenty of support. And then on November the 12th, we had a um, surgery. He got, he cut the, they, they cut the, um, the tumor off. And when Dr. Spector came in, uh, Dr. Spector's a beautiful guy. He's a ear, nose, and throat guy at U of M. Just a, a great guy. He comes in and says, we think, I didn't hear the we think. We, had, we got all the cancer. All I heard was we got all the cancer. And so, which means it was undetectable. But then on December 18th, the scan showed that it had metastasized through his torso. Um, <clears throat> and so he started chemo December 24th, Christmas Eve. And on February the, uh, February the 27th, 2014, my son, Michael Damon Harris, was pronounced dead at 11.02 p.m. And so we had his, uh, <laughs> you know, and. 
thank you. But the, you know, God is, 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 was with us the whole time. God was with us the whole time. So with, um, we have Memorial March the 8th. I had a uh, radical prostatectomy on May 1st. And they, they, they took my prostate out. So, um, and I've been eight years, by the grace of God, I've been eight years of undetectable cancer since then. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, and you might say, well, where's the bright side in all of that? Well, at Michael's memorial, I, I, when telling Michael's story, that story helped parents reconnect or connect with their children. And with me on the cancer, you, you heard by the grace of God the things that I, I've been trying to do to help other people because on this, on other people's journey, since I've been ahead, I can be a guide and support and things. Now, the last thing is, I wanna go back to when Michael was pronounced dead. I, I go home and about an hour later, I'm sitting there, and as Dr. King says, sometimes you have to calmly and honestly look at yourself, which I did. Mark, when people ask you how you're doing, you always say fantastic. Are things fantastic now? And I thought about it, and the scripture came to me, in everything give thanks, because this is the will of God concerning you. He said everything, and because it's God's will, I'm still fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Wow. Thank you. And now, our final storyteller of the evening, I'd like to introduce Brita Miller. Brita is a storyteller, an author, a playwright, actor, and recovering caregiver. Her experience is caring for her mother for nearly six years, including hospice care, had shaped her own journey. And she shares those lessons in a variety of creative ways. A lifelong Michigander, she's a graduate of the University of Detroit Mercy, a skilled storyteller. Her video stories have gone viral, and she's appeared on the Moth Story Hour on NPR. Her acclaimed one-woman play, Mrs. Kelly's Journey Home, brings to the stage the experiences that are often unspoken of for so many generations of immigrants and adults caring for their aging parents. I think what many of us have that experience. Rita lives in Manchester with her two, with her husband, not her two husbands. Rita lives in Manchester with her husband, Jim, their children, along with two dogs and two ginormous cats. Her story is Mrs. Kelly's journey home. Rita Miller. My mother, Mary Kelly, was an ordinary woman with an extraordinary outlook on life. She was a woman of great faith in God and in herself. She always said she was blessed. Mary Kelly loved to travel, and even though she never learned to drive, she really got around. She was always open to new experiences. I always said she'd go to the opening of a donut shop. <laughs> she just loved life. And she taught me that, even when she was at the end of hers. This is my mom and her beloved Toby, her Yorkshire terrorist, as we like to call him. <laughs> when, mom, when mom turned 80, she developed congestive heart failure, and that led to vascular dementia. And I learned so much. And uh, vascular dementia is different than Alzheimer's disease, and it comes and goes. So some days she would be sharp and herself, and other days she would be confused and anxious. She'd been on hospice care for over six months in our home. Well, she had moved in with us, actually. And she, I, I think being in the house with kids and dogs and cats really helped her. But she was often confused and thought there were two Bridas, the good Brida and the bad Brida. <laughs> and she would complain to me about the bad Brida, which was great. I got all the scoop. She would, t you know, the bad Brida who would make her take mind-altering drugs like Advil. <laughs> so 
One day, she'd been on hospice about six months, and she made a special request. She asked me to find a priest to come to the house to give her the last rites or the sacrament of the sick. This is a sacrament in the Catholic Church that is intended to give comfort and peace to the gravely ill. Now, my mom was not a big fan of our parish priest at the time, say no more. So I had to go to a nearby town and ask the priest in that very large parish if he would come to our home. We didn't know him personally. He was very kind, and he said he had a full schedule, he was super busy, but yes, he would come about 15 miles to our, to our home for this sacrament for my mom. He said he'd have to come very early, and he could not stay long because he had such a full schedule. I said, that would be fine. So he arrived, and on the day that he arrived, my mom was feeling pretty good. She was herself, she was alert, she was up. And he came in, and I'm up, she went back into her room, and I brought him in to meet her. And she was laying in bed with her arms over her chest. <laughs> this was very odd. So he started to unpack his blessed oils, the stole, and the crucifix, and he was about to begin when she interrupted him. Now hang on a moment there, Father. Before you begin, I have a question for you. Do you know what this sacrament was called originally? Why, um, do, do you mean extreme unction? Yes, that's very good. You may proceed. <laughs> well, he got a big smile on his face, and he told her that his grandmother was Irish. Well, I left them to it and went to my desk to do some work. An hour had passed, and they were talking and laughing, and I went in, and his entire manner had changed. And as he went to leave, I thanked him and asked him, Father, uh, will you pray for my mother? For Mrs. Kelly? Oh no, she's fine, she's all set. You, I'll pray for. <laughs> well, mom continued to decline and she, her good days were fewer and far between and she was growing anxious and she told me that she was going on a journey. And I said, really, where are you going? She said, I don't know, but I'm going somewhere. Well, she would, tell me this a lot. One day, she asked me to bring up her suitcase from the basement, and I had learned not to argue. So I brought up her suitcase, the good one, and I remembered how, how much she loved to travel, and she would always get so excited when she had booked a trip that she got her suitcase out six weeks before she was actually leaving. I set it next to her chair. She never put anything in it, but it seemed to calm her. And then one day, she called me to her side, and she said, Frida, I, I want you to get me the bus schedule to Dublin. I want to go home. I have to go home. Well, at this stage, I had not been sleeping. She had really declined, and I, and I knew her days were really few, the days that she would have left, and, and I was a wreck. I had nothing. I didn't know what to say to this request. I didn't know what to do, so I did what I always did. I changed the subject, and I offered her another cup of tea. Anyway, she kept at it every day. Would you get me the bus schedule? And every day, I had nothing. I didn't know what to do. Well, one day, she was seated in her chair, and she was really anxious. She was wringing her hands, and I could see she had tears in her eyes. And I, I, I went to her and said, Mom, why, why are you so upset? It's that Brida. She's horrible. I keep asking her for the bus schedule and she just won't get it for me. Well, something in my brain clicked. And I said to her, Mom, don't you worry about that bitch. I'm here today. I'm going to figure it out. I had no idea what I was going to do. I couldn't actually take her to Ireland. She was too frail to travel. She couldn't even leave the house at this stage. And I thought, what, what would help her? What could ease her anxiety? What could I possibly do? 
And I thought back to how excited she got before a trip and how much she loved to travel and how she was so happy when she had booked a trip. So I thought, what, what if I could make her a fake airline ticket? So I went to my computer and I Googled fake airline ticket. <laughs> and what appeared on the screen was the template of a boarding pass. So I started to fill it in. De departing airport, DTW. Arriving airport, now this was tricky. I could type in D-U-B for Dublin, but why not go one better? I typed heaven, it took it. Then departure dates, open. And I looked and I saw that it was first class, of course. This was perfect. I found some cardstock and I hit print, and in my hands was a boarding pass. I walked over to mom's chair and said, Mom, you don't have to worry anymore. You're good to go. You're all set. And she took the ticket, the boarding pass, and she looked at it and said, This is great. I'm going to show Father Will this one. And over the next few weeks, as people came to visit her for the last time, instead of being anxious and worried, she was excited to show them her boarding pass. And she'd say, look what Brida got for me. And they all had a good laugh, and they told her she was indeed blessed. I've seen a few miracles in my life. But I think finding that boarding pass online and seeing the look of delight in my mother's eyes was my favorite. She never asked me for the bus schedule again, and she kept that boarding pass near to her until the day she died. And when she was gone, I was really surprised at myself. I wasn't overwhelmed with grief, and I felt guilty for the relief that I felt for her and for me. But then I realized I had been grieving for years. They say dementia is the long goodbye, and it really is. But now, now I could remember the woman who was so extraordinary, and she could be herself again. Thank you. Rita Miller, Rita Miller. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Brita, for your story. Thank you, Brita, for all you have done for Big Hearts for Seniors, continues to do so much for this event. How much did we say our goal was to this, this year? What was it? We've made $117,000. I feel like dancing. You don't want to see it. Um, and I just want to say my wife, Jerry, and I are going to add 5,000 to that. So let's. This has been a wonderful evening. I hope you all felt that it was wonderful. Um, there are a couple of thank yous here. One is to the Billy Harrington Trio. My goodness, what great music you guys play tonight. Thank you. Really wonderful, amazing. Thank you to the sponsors again. The sponsors are fabulous. They, we couldn't have done this. We couldn't have hit that goal without the sponsors. Thank you so much. Truly appreciated. This is what makes a great community. Thank you to the volunteers and the staff who put this event together. A really amazing job everybody did. So a few closing thoughts. A few closing thoughts. We hope that after tonight you know a bit more about the resources here in our community that are serving older adults every single day, and in particular, older adults who are in great need. It's really important what all of you have done tonight. And if someone that you know needs help, please reach out to these five amazing resources. And if you're interested in getting involved or providing support for these programs, 
please reach out. Information for all of the programs are in your brochure, in your own program that you have, and online, or feel free to reach out to any of the committee members or staff members to be connected and to learn more. Would you mind just one final time the committee members and staff members standing up just in case somebody wants to reach out to you? Would you mind? Thank you so much again. There you go. There you go. Woo! Yeah. General housekeeping, if you are an auction winner or have questions about the auction, please go back to the lobby and pick up your item. Great, and thanks for getting it. Feel free to stop by the lobby to meet the storytellers, the program leaders, and the amazing volunteers, as we said, and thank you once again for your participation and support. Hope you all have a good rest of the evening, and please have a safe trip home. Take care, thank you.